In the last few minutes, the Royal College of Emergency Medicine has released new figures revealing that more than 100,000 patients have waited for longer than 12 hours for treatment at A&E since the start of the winter. Senior medics are calling for increased funding and extra beds to cope with overcrowding. Of course, that was before even the coronavirus emerged. But the planning must now assume that these very significant expansion in cases, that that very significant expansion in cases could be imminent and make concrete plans to deal with it. So how will they cope? Here's Deborah Cohen. How do you stop something whose very nature means it must spread? Can you slow it down, contain it, before it overwhelms? The UK is currently in containment phase for COVID-19. So severe cases are hospitalised, contacts are traced, and anyone who has come into contact is supposed to self-isolate. The next phase is delay. Infections need to be staggered so the NHS isn't swamped. The government will be announcing their detailed plans tomorrow, but healthcare leaders have described the scale of the challenge they face. There are already nearly 10,000 doctor and 40,000 nurse vacancies in the NHS in England. The government's contingency plans may include newly retired doctors and nurses being asked to return to the NHS. I'm very concerned about the epidemiology of this illness in that what we do know about it, it is more likely to affect those people who already have an underlying health condition, such as a lung condition, or are elderly and frail. And of course, uh, doctors on the whole are retired because they're over 60 and they will be in that vulnerable group. Health professionals may also have other care commitments, such as their own children. If schools close, then this could impact on the NHS. The UK currently has fewer acute beds relative to its population than almost any other comparable health system. This isn't literally physical beds, it's beds that are staffed properly. So the NHS has a, a lower number of beds on average than many other European countries. It is important to understand the way in which healthcare is delivered. So a lot of healthcare in this country is delivered to people supported in their own homes. So bed numbers are not the only thing to consider. But it does mean that if we need to increase the number of people in hospitals at short notice, that could be more difficult. So we might have to take decisions like cancelling planned surgery, for example. The wider picture in the NHS has been described by senior hospital medics as one of grave concern. They point to an already stretched system with high demand and any further delay to plan procedures will have an impact on already lengthy waiting times. To help mitigate the impact on the NHS and stop the spread, official advice is to stay away and phone NHS 111 there are uh, concerns that there are very long waits for NHS 111 and what I heard today was that um, some call handlers who have been taught a new brief because this is a message that is changing very rapidly uh, maybe not be necessarily instilling the sense of reassurance that people need and I think it is up for, to us at the British Medical Association and, and our members to try and reassure you that the information that is being given by NHS 111 is, at, is up to up to date. Hospitals can scale back the services they offer, but this isn't the case for social care and it's not so clear cut for general practice. We've seen in recent months and years that the pressures in social care have meant that services are really focusing on people who are in the most severe need. And obviously that's, that's quite hard to switch on and off. We, we can say that the NHS can stop doing things if necessary. But if social care services are short of staff and therefore have to stop providing care to people who are really in need, that could have quite a knock-on consequence for the health service. For GP practices, I think they, the challenge that they have there is that people quite rightly and understandably see the GP as their, their first port of call. So if GPs um, are taking a lot of calls or seeing a lot of people who are concerned they have coronavirus, then that might limit their capacity to see other people. And again, there could be a knock-on consequence for hospitals if people then turn up to the, the emergency department instead. The NHS can be good at pulling together in a crisis, but to curb this spread will be costly and no money has been promised yet. Deborah Cohen there. No one from the government wanted to come on the programme tonight, but the Department of Health did tell us the UK is a world leader in preparing for and managing disease outbreaks. 
and our approach will be led by medical experts. We've been clear we expect coronavirus to have some impact on the UK and a global pandemic could have a pronounced effect on the NHS, which is why we're planning for any eventuality. So how big a trial is the health service and country more widely about to face? We're joined by John Ashworth, the Shadow Health Secretary, and Dr Catherine Henderson, President of the Royal College of Emergency Medicine. Welcome to you both. John, I mean, you'd called for Boris Johnson to take charge of this, and he has. So job done in that sense. <laughs> job only started, I'm afraid. Look, can I first of all say my thoughts, obviously, with all those who have got the virus, and I just want to pay tribute to the NHS staff who are working exceedingly hard, and indeed pay tribute to the Chief Medical Officer, who I think has shown exceptional leadership. I mean, the report from, or the quotation from, your, from the Department of Health spokesperson is broadly correct. We do have very good plans in place, and we've got world-leading experts working on this. But let's be honest, if this escalates, and it is now becoming extremely serious, our NHS, with the current resources it has, will struggle. Because we know we've got 10 years of cutbacks, we've lost beds over these 10 years, we're short of 100,000 staff. Can it's why I've been calling for extra resources in terms, to go into the NHS. In terms of, of, of politics and, and how this is managed politically, I mean, we know that, for example, the First Minister of Wales was at the meeting today uh, because of the devolved... Uh, sure. nature of government in the UK. Would you have wanted to see Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London, there as well? Yes, and I'm rather surprised he wasn't there. I hope that was a, an oversight, a mistake. I hope well, they will... It's because I, it's, it's not on the same legal basis, presumably, I as know, the but devolved I mean, government. Uh, uh, but, I mean, you know, Sadiq Khan is responsible for public services across London, and there's a lot of people in London. So I hope the government will correct that for their, for their future meetings. And in, just in terms of, uh, if you like, a joined-up or a national approach, would you like to see Labour? Well, in uh, fairness... Uh, Sadiq Khan or, or another uh, Labour? I mean, in fairness... In, in those fa meetings. In fairness, the Chief Medical Officer has briefed me as the Shadow Secretary of State. The Secretary of State has kept me updated, as, in, as, in, as indeed has the Chief Executive of uh, NHS England. And we've been broadly supportive of the government's attempts to contain the virus and delay the spread of the virus. Where my concerns are, are about this, the, the resourcing of the NHS going forward. Can I bring you in, uh, Catherine Henson? Um, look, we know from the Scottish government, we're trying to just get a sense of what's in this tomorrow. Uh, they talked about a 4% incidence of coronavirus potentially in Scotland, which is hundreds of thousands in that population. Now, presumably, if you extrapolate that to Great Britain as a whole, that could be millions, couldn't it? I mean, how, how, how will the system cope with something like that? Well, at the moment, we are enacting all the pandemic flu type plans that we've got in place. Um, the key thing is that we start to separate those who've got the virus from those who turn out not to have the virus. And from an emergency department and emergency system point of view, the absolute key thing is that we make sure that there's alternatives than coming to the hospital for patients who need to be tested. And that's the direction of travel that NHS England is certainly talking about. They're talking about getting up and running community testing because what we really don't want to see happening is a situation where a relatively fit person who is a carrier of the virus is coming into a hospital that has got sick patients in it because that would be, from our point of view, a very, very difficult situation indeed. And the figures you've released this evening have underlined just how strained the system is in, in hospitals. So indeed. So it, it, we happen to be launching our strategy around, you know, what, what do we need to be doing in the medium to long term about the emergency pathway? And one key part of that is getting rid of crowded emergency departments and getting rid of having patients in corridors. Now, if your system under strain, obviously having this additional work is not something we would ever have chosen to do and we will manage it, but it's really essential that we look to a plan that gets patients out of emergency departments as quickly as possible. Never has people, we must eliminate corridor care. I can't bear the fact that it's even got the name corridor care. We need to get patients moved off. It's not something that's going to happen immediately. We've got to get the beds and the staff for that. John, just, just coming back on, uh, on this point about uh, what we can expect, I mean, you talked about a, a, a briefing from the Chief Medical Officer. Do you think those figures that we heard in Scotland today, about 4% of the population potentially, is that the right sort of ballpark? And do you think 
Catherine's point about trying to keep people out of hospitals is also part of the plan well, that, well, that look, we'll this, get briefed on tomorrow. Well, look, this is, a, you know, this is a new virus and the medical experts are trying to fully understand what its likely increase in prevalence is going to be. But on this point about corridor care, I mean, this is absolutely uh, uh, vital. I mean, we've got people languishing on trolleys because they can't get a bed in the hospital. Now, what is probably going to happen, I suspect, in the NHS in the coming weeks is that NHS chief, chief execs, or perhaps from, uh, ordered from the, from the top, are going to have to make some serious decisions. They may well have to abandon elective operations and delay carrying out routine operations. But they probably can't turn people away from A&E if people are in desperate need of help and support. And yet that is part of the system that is really going to be under strain or further under strain in the coming weeks. But if the signs are up there, uh, as they are, I think, in many hospitals, saying don't come in, if you think, uh, will people cooperate with that or will they, we really out of so. desperation? I think, I mean, I think we really need to encourage people to read the information that's out there because actually phoning 111, 119 is very, very busy and it needs to be taking calls from people who've got a reasonable reason for thinking that they are in risk. That's the route for information. But there's also information on, you know, on the public health website. Once somebody has been sent to hospital and need testing, they will get tested. But actually, increasingly, we need to be able to test people without them necessarily even leaving their own home. You know, what we want somebody is through people... the letterbox, basically. Well, no, somebody coming and knocking on their door. It's, like, it's a bit more friendly than just through the letterbox. But somebody coming in, somebody who can give them advice, somebody who can actually do a risk assessment and do the test. This is, this is potentially a very large number of people. Mm. And one of the ideas being floated is retired staff being brought back in. Could, could that work in your view? I'm not sure that that's going to be where we need to go. I'm not sure we're going to need retired physicians coming in to do this. What we're going to need is a decision about who we are testing once it gets to large numbers. If somebody's fit and healthy and has the symptoms, do we just assume that they've got it and we ask them to self-isolate? Those are the big decisions that, that the CMO is going to start to make in the next few days, I suspect. And do you think, John, finally, uh, do you think the public can handle this? I mean, they're, they're obviously planning to be quite frank about some of the possible uh, societal impacts of this. Can the public care? Oh, I mean, I, I think I think the public will we will pull together and we will get through this. But this part, can I just, this part about testing is a good one. This is why we need more resources. All of those tests will probably have to be couriered to labs somewhere. Unless the government give hospital trusts more money, they'll be expected to find that from their existing budgets. John Ashworth, Catherine Henderson, thank you both very much.